I think that philosophy aspires to geometric certainty and eternality, timelessness, but it seldom achieves it and is none the worse for that. I see philosophy as uh, a constitutively informal study because it's what you're doing when you don't know what the right questions are yet. There were many times in my childhood where I, like many children, found myself thinking philosophical thoughts, wondering about solipsism, wondering about what my mind was. And I was lucky to find people that encouraged me without trying to encourage me. They just expressed some interest or responded in a way that didn't discourage me from doing that. And at some point, uh, I think I was about 12, uh, a counselor at summer camp responded to one of my little soliloquies with, uh, 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 Dan, I think you're a philosopher. And I thought, oh, wow, uh, what's a philosopher? You mean you could actually do this for a living? I don't know about most children, but many children come upon philosophical ideas without treating them in that sense. But uh, what am I? What happens when I wake up, when I go to sleep? Is the world real? Uh, the solipsism question. I think that part of the unconventional, not worried by, by rules, Curiosity of children often leads them into philosophical waters, and most of them are probably actually somewhat repelled by this. Those who, those who have a taste for it can go on and become philosophers. We don't need a whole lot more philosophers, I don't think, but we need some. The very idea of perception, of having a mind, and what colors were uh, really made an impression on me. I dabbled in trying to be an artist. I one time thought I was going to be a sculptor. And uh, took it quite seriously and took the question of the relationship between the minds of, of an artist or the mind of an observer and uh, an object. Uh, I thought a lot about that. And as an undergraduate, whenever I could, I wrote papers that tried to nibble away at the problem of what on earth can vision be and how does it relate to the world that the physicists tell us is, is causing it. So that was, that was a major preoccupation of mine. The mind was certainly always encouraged to, by the family and by my friends to pursue my artistic endeavors. And I, uh, 
I did up to the point where I was showing pieces in galleries and entering competitions and doing quite well. But I discovered that I just couldn't stand the art world. Artists were fine, or at least some of them were, but gallery owners and critics and art buyers, I really didn't like art buyers. The two most obvious mentors for me are the philosophers I was lucky to work with. As an undergraduate, I worked with Willard Van Orman Quine, the great Harvard logician and philosopher of language. And then I went to graduate school and worked with Gilbert Ryle in Oxford. And in the case of Quine, I read his work when I was very young, when I was 16 or 17, I read his book uh, from a logical point of view. And I stayed up all night reading that book and thought, oh, this guy is fascinating, but he's wrong, <laughs> as only a 17-year-old can decide. So I decided to transfer to Harvard uh, from the Wesleyan University where I was so I could uh, confront the wrong man in his, in his lair. And I actually spent three years at Harvard uh, working on my uh, undergraduate honors thesis criticizing Quine's view of ordinary language. When I got to Oxford, I found that I wasn't the great anti-Quinean that I thought I was. I was, in fact, the village Quinean. I accepted much more of Quine than anybody else of my graduate students. So I began to realize that uh, although I still had some disagreements with uh, Professor Quine, uh, he was more my hero than my, than my target. And Ryle was a sweet, sweet man. I didn't think, I loved his book, The Concept of Mind, and I'm very Rileyan, and it's often noted that I'm what you get when you cross Quine and Ryle together, and it's a, a, a respect for ordinary language and its power to set the terms of discussion, which then have to be uh, moved into other directions. And, uh, uh, a certain sort of principled austerity and skepticism from Quine. When we speak, when we write, our words are about something. Philosophers call that intentionality. We could call it just aboutness. How can anything be about anything? One idea is, well, we have ideas in our brain in our mind. Those are about things. And then words are mm, copies, public copies of our ideas. That's just about backwards according to both Ryle and Quine. Quine's great contribution was to provide the foundations for a proper scientific empirical study of language and the role of aboutness in language, which comes in late in the story. Ryle's contribution was to show how easy it is for our talking about our minds to mislead us into postulating an inner sanctum where the ideas are very mysterious, non-material things. And so the two of them together provide a, a wonderful foundation for building a theory of the mind that handles the problem of aboutness. How can minds be about things in the world? How can we think about things without going overboard and putting wonder tissue or mysterious powers in the head? Well, this is just one of my walking sticks. Um, at my height and my age, I don't have very good balance on rough ground, so I find it extremely helpful to have a walking stick. And I picked this up on Outer Long Island, which is not far from here, about 15 miles by water, uh, in 2006, according to what I wrote on there. So this is just a, a piece of spruce that I found on the in the woods there when we were walking along, and I needed a stick and grabbed it. And I hardly did anything to it. I just chopped the end off a bit, chopped the end off there, and it was already pretty smooth. 
and back on the boat I put the date and the place where I found it and then I took it with me just this last year uh, 2014 on a schooner to Greenland and it says Kalashli Nunat which is the Greenlandic name for Greenland uh, where I could not have walked on the tundra there without this stick it was a, a, a absolute lifesaver and then I took it with me more recently to Sicily where I used it to troop around on the cobbled streets and through the uh, vineyards and uh, the ancient Greek ruins. So now I'm carving Sicilia uh, 2014 on it as well. And uh, as a matter of uh, sort of silly principle, I just use a jackknife for things like this. I thought Sicilia should be in italics. Back in the 60s, I decided that if a philosopher, I was a philosopher, was going to talk about the mind, about consciousness, I had to learn science. I had to learn physiology and psychology, neuroscience, and artificial intelligence, which was just getting underway. This was viewed as bizarre behavior. Uh, many of my fellow graduate students thought I was taking leave of my senses to spend all this time doing the science. But it paid off. It was right. I was right. I had taught myself a bit, been well tutored a bit, and many people in the field were surprised and delighted to find that I knew anything at all about their fields and that I was interested. And they took it upon themselves to make sure I knew more. So they took me in and gave me wonderful personal mentoring tutorials uh, on how they saw the issues. So I have been lucky to have almost no formal training in any science at all. But I've had the very best tutors uh, who have... Uh, taken to the project of educating me and making me stop making those silly mistakes. And I am actually not afraid of making silly mistakes. And so I make them and then they point them out to me and I correct them. My first year as a graduate student in Oxford, I knew very little biology, very little. I remember vividly getting interested in how our brains work. I didn't know. I had not been a science major. I'd been a philosophy major. I asked a friend of mine who was in medical school, you know, what are brains made of? And he told me about neurons and how they had um, multiple inputs and a single branching output. And uh, it just hit me. All of a sudden, oh! I could see, in principle, how you could put those things together into a network, into a structure that could evolve it, without the help of a magic demon inside that was the teacher or that was the redesigner. It could redesign itself. And in a way, I think it's the only idea that anybody's ever had which isn't question begging. Because learning has to be, has to be, a process where you start with one design, excellent as it may be, and take information from the world and improve the design. That's what learning is. It's, it's bootstrapping to a better design on the basis of what you already have. Either that's a, an evolutionary process or it's magic. I've often said that if I gave a prize to the best idea anybody ever had, I'd give it to Darwin, ahead of Newton, ahead of Einstein, ahead of everybody else. I think the Darwinian idea of natural selection unifies the world. It unifies the world of cause and matter and physics with the world of meaning and purpose, uh, consciousness, 
the whole spectrum of life depends on uniting the living with the non-living, the meaning with the non-meaning, the purposeful with the merely mechanical or merely uh, physical. And Darwin's idea is the backbone that does that. The world of cause and matter and physics. Cause and matter and physics. physics. The world of meaning, purpose, consciousness, cause, and matter, and physics, physics, cause, matter, purpose, consciousness, meaning, purpose, matter, cause. The whole spectrum. If we were going to have a successful theory of consciousness, it was going to have to be counterintuitive. Hard to believe at first because our intuitions tell us so strongly facts, facts about our minds that just aren't facts, they aren't true. And I think the most potent and seductive is the idea that inside our heads, somewhere, there is a sort of show going on. Uh, colors and shapes, and sounds, and itches and tingles are happening in a special, private, subjective arena. And we are the audience, each of us is the audience for that set of apparitions, appearances, representations. I call that place the Cartesian theater. Uh, it's the mind as Descartes conceived of it in the 17th century. There's no such place. It seems to stand to reason. There has to be. Look, I can close my eyes and there I am. I'm in that place. Well, you think you are. That's what you think's going on. Here's what's really going on, blah, blah, blah. Oh, there's more. There's more. You're leaving something important out. And it's this hunch that there's something more beyond the spike trains and the coordinating activity of the nervous system, there's got to be this extra wonderful layer that makes life worth living. That intuition is almost universal and very potent and simply wrong. And so a large part of my work is engaged in trying to show people to their initial amazement and disbelief they're actually wrong about that. I think the reason that people succumb to this illusion is they stop one step too early. They think about consciousness and they imagine all oh, events in the brain leading up, leading up, leading up, and then ta-da, there's consciousness happening in their head. They say, wow, isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? And they stop the process right there. And they don't ask the next question, what I call the hard question. And then what happens? Well, and then what happens? What happens, of course, is what I started to say. They respond. They think, wow, wow. And then they 
they start cataloging whatever it is that's in consciousness, and I've got this thought and that feeling and a little itch in my toe, and, and they think about it, and maybe they talk about it, and it lays down traces in memory. Well, they should start taking seriously all the stuff that happens next or that can happen next that can follow from their being conscious of X or Y or Z. Once you've got that catalog and you've really done a good job of getting that catalog, ask yourself whether, and isn't that what being conscious is? Being, responding in all these ways. Why do you suppose there's this extra materi uh, mysterious thing that's at the nexus that is the cause of this? It's a very powerful feeling, but it's, I argue, it's just a mistake. The cause of all your reactions, your emotional reactions, your memories, are just more spike train combinations in your nervous system that you're adding one cause too many by putting in the quale, the internal subjective mysterious whatchamacallit, isn't actually doing any work. So just divide through, let it, let it go. And then, then you've got a good theory. Well, this is a brand new lobster pot. I'm not gonna be able to use it because I'm not a Maine resident. And so I can't get a, a recreational license until I'm a Maine resident. But this is the very latest kind. They used to be made of wood, of course. Um, the lobsters go in through these funnels and eventually they get back here uh, and uh, there's a, a bait bag there where, where they get fed and that's what draws them in and these are weights to keep it on the bottom and the law now requires that there be these biodegradable escape hatches so that if you lose a trap you haven't killed the lobster. The lobster can get out when it's, uh, when it's through because the, the uh, door will simply dissolve and uh, you'll be able to get out. I think that, of course, a lobster has a self, a lobstery sort of self. Uh, it protects itself. It, it could eat itself if it was hungry. It could snap off one of its own claws. It'll snap off its brother's claw, but it won't snap off its own. So it has, it has a sense of self in a very uh, simplistic way, I suppose. Um, and uh, it has uh, uh, neurons that are pain sensors and so forth. Uh, but I think that the uh, whole system is so rudimentary that we can call it suffering uh, if we want to, uh, but it is not at all like the suffering of uh, mammals, let's say, or more particularly human beings. Uh, my view is, uh, to some people, notorious. I think that that. When people think about animal suffering, their favorite examples are usually dogs. And dogs, in fact, do suffer and can suffer. But for a sort of curious reason, the reason they're so much, uh, so capable of suffering, they're really unlike most other uh, uh, mammals in the, because they've been unconsciously bred for being like us. and. Uh, uh, there's a huge difference between a wolf, its closest wild relative, and a dog in the, in the suffering department. If we extrapolate from what we know from our own experience of dogs to other animals, we come out with a, an inflated, an exaggerated sense of what their minds, the minds of other creatures are like. They are wily, they're crafty, they, they are conscious in some important sense. They have feeling in some important sense, but their capacity to suffer, I think, is severely diminished because they don't have the capacity to look ahead and look back the way we can. They, their, their pain isn't spread out in their minds the way it is in ours. And uh, I think there's no comparison on that score. The question of when consciousness emerges is bedeviled by the fact that consciousness isn't one thing. It's a whole 
family of related things which come together pretty well in us and already when you look at a, any other species you begin to see some important features missing or probably missing. So we have a, a, a mixed bag of phenomena. I think that that mixed bag emerges quite inevitably and automatically with certain kinds of complexity. It has to be the right kind of complexity, not any complexity will do. And the kind that I think matters is, again, to be answered by Darwinian considerations. It's when you have self-regulating, self-sustaining, self-repairing, self-protective entities Notice that includes plants and bacteria. Living things have to have particular sorts of complexity. And when that complexity ramifies in various ways, then the features of consciousness begin to emerge quite clearly. And on that path up to us, the ones that can talk about our consciousness, there's no uh, metaphysical threshold. There's important physical thresholds. There's, there's non-linearities, if you like, in, in the acquisition of these uh, features, but they all follow from the organization underlying. Well, you know, we say free as a bird because the bird can fly wherever it wants and the lobster is free in a sense. It's until it's captured, it can go where it wants. Uh, but its wants are very limited. It has very minimal uh, capacities for uh, venturing out, trying new things. Um, they are exploratory. They are, of course, scavengers. Uh, so they have some of the necessary conditions for free will, but not the kind of free will that licenses moral responsibility. Um, no animal except for human beings has the kind of mind that has the sort of competences that license us to hold them responsible. We don't hold bears responsible. If a bear kills a person, that's not, that's not homicide. That's not murder. Uh, 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 the bear doesn't have the mental wherewithal, at, in effect, to know what it's doing in the way that we can know what we're doing. And I think that's one of the hallmarks of free will. Free will, if it's going to be a serious concept, has got to be one which we use to distinguish those agents in the world who can justly be held responsible for what they do, both praising their heroism and their, and their, and their wonderful contributions on the one hand, and uh, uh, condemning, punishing, criticizing on the other. Uh, the uh, old saying noblesse oblige applies right here. Human beings, sane, competent, normal, adult human beings have a set of competences that oblige them to govern their behavior in a way that they can do and that no other animal can. On that path up path up to us. Talk about our consciousness. Talk about our consciousness. There's no metaphysical threshold. Metaphysical threshold. Metaphysical threshold. On that path up. Path up. Path up. To us. On that path up. Path up. Path up. There's no metaphysical threshold. Metaphysical threshold. On that path.
for several millennia, people have had the idea that if our bodies and our minds are just non-miraculous parts of the fabric of material causation in the world, then we don't have free will in the sense that we're not able to make the decisions we want to make and we can't be held responsible unless we have free will. Um, a very powerful intuition and very understandable and I think demonstrably wrong, uh, whatever its distinguished lineage. It's as if people want a kind of moral levitation where they can float unaffected by gravity and make decisions. When you put it that way, people can see, no, 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 I don't want that. Well, what do you want? They want their mind, they want their decisions to be their decisions. Well, yes, but who, who are they? What, what is the self? Uh, I once said, if you make yourself really small, you can externalize virtually everything. And that's what they're doing. They're thinking of themselves as sort of a tiny point somewhere in their brain. And they want that point to be exempt from the laws of causation that govern everything that goes on in their brain. Well, they're making a, a profound mistake. The self, a self which could be worth caring about, a self that could bear responsibility, has to be a rather large thing. It has to have many parts and memory and plans and moral education and feeling. In other words, don't make the self small, make it large. When you make the self large, recognize that who you are is not a little homunculus sitting in the Cartesian theater, but a live embodied person, then you can begin to recognize that you have if you're normal and healthy, you have a very important sort of autonomy. Yes, your autonomy is not divorced from the causal fabric of the world. A good thing. If it were, you couldn't act. But it is distinguishable as a locus of decision-making, which is in large measure a creation of your own life. So you're as responsible for it as you are if you make a robot and send the robot out in the world and it does some harm, you're responsible. You made that robot. Well, you made your own mind to some degree too, once you're an adult. You had a lot of help. You didn't make it from nothing. You're not absolutely responsible, but you are wisely and justly held responsible because you're good enough to know better. I think that one of the foibles of philosophy, which other people who are not philosophers are also susceptible to, is a, a strategic principle which is just bad. When there's something you want to protect, you decide that the way to protect it is to make it absolute. And you inflate it. And you say, no, no gradualism here. Either absolute, utter responsibility or no responsibility at all. The idea of sharing responsibility or being responsible for practical purposes strikes them as giving up the game. You've given away too much. So they hold out for the absolute, which they can never have without miracles, and then they wring their hands because they can't be absolutely responsible. And uh, they can't be absolutely altruistic. They can't even be absolutely conscious. They can't absolutely understand something. Understanding comes in degrees too. Don't use that sound. <laughs>
I got a sticking accelerator, I have to kick it loose. <laughs> it gets caught, I've been meaning to fix it, but I ran out of time just before we went to Sicily. It's the next thing on my list. If there's one thing that ethicists agree on, is the simple formula, ought implies can. If you cannot do something, then it, you aren't obliged to do it. It's Well, the trouble is that we now can do many things that were impossible before. We can have robot warriors. We can have, have test tube babies that we can genetically redesign. There's all sorts of things that are now technologically within our power that weren't until very recently. Nobody in ethics, as far as I can tell, has taken seriously this explosion of competence, of can-do, which creates a flood of oughts. And most of us, I think, now feel oppressed with a few clicks of the button, I can feed a family in Africa thanks to Oxfam. I can, I can uh, support the works of Doctors Without Borders. I can, I can do all sorts of things that I never used to be able to do. What should I do? How to prioritize all the good things I can do? I myself feel oppressed by this uh, huge uh, increase in personal power. And it's the ethical question that needs attention and I don't see it being given it. We found this, oh, about 10 years ago, I guess. But my first car was a Volkswagen Beetle, actually older than this one. My first car was a 1957 Beetle. This is a 72. So I have driven these cars all my life. This one has to be babied into life. It's pretty old and shaky, but it's fun. I think the thing that amazes me more than uh, anything else is the efficiency and power with which evolutionary processes can generate beautiful, elegant, efficient designs. Uh, Francis Crick used to joke about Orgel's second rule, evolution is cleverer than you are. And that is certainly true. The, the ingenuity of the designs that nature comes up with without itself having any ingenuity at all is even when you appreciate it, even when you expect it, it's still startling and delightful. There is an illusion, which is, I think, just an illusion of myopia, of nearsightedness, which supports the idea that, that we've stopped evolution or that evolution stops with us. 
but that's just wrong. It's sort of at every level. We're no longer being selected for um, swiftness of foot or strength of arm, but we're selected for health, for fecundity, for capacity to survive and thrive. Now we're selected for the capacity to use language. It's been strong selection for linguistic ability. This opens up all together new paths, new selective pressures, and we create further evolutionary processes of culture and then within our own minds. The planet, the biosphere, has changed more in the last 10,000 years since human beings developed agriculture and started building their culture. It changed more in the last 10,000 years than it changed in millions of years before. The tempo has sped up by orders of magnitude and evolution is still going on and we can now to some degree direct it, but only to some degree. And at the end of the day, the final test is how well does it reproduce? Sometimes people say, you know, were you ever a child, Dan? <laughs> Are you really comfortable being a, so comfortable being a grown-up? I think grown-ups have rendered themselves immune to the superstitions that are comforting to children and to a lot of people who cling to what, by my lights, are childish superstitions. Just doesn't work for me, but I happily don't feel the need for that consolation because the sheer fact that I have been able to have a breathtakingly interesting and fruitful, gratifying life with many wonderful events is all the consolation I need. I, I think life is precious because there is no afterlife. Don't blow it, you only get one chance. And I feel so grateful that I've been given this chance. The fact that there is nobody to accept my gratitude except my fellow human beings who have made this wonderful world, uh, that's got to be my consolation. Yeah, it was a great, great day for sailing, a little chilly. <laughs>